So thank you, Dan, for introduction. Uh, first thing first, to who of you who came to this room for a talk called CI for OpenShift, and now we are looking at the at the title slide, wondering if you are in the right room. Yes, you are. I will deal with OKD OpenShift situation in a, in a while. So I, my name is Petr, like, like Dan introduced me, and I'm a member of the OpenShift Developer Productivity Test Platform team, and we are basically somehow the CI team for the OpenShift upstream. Uh, we are not the only ones responsible for this. Uh, for this. It are, it's, it's a huge system consisting of many parts, some of them by Kubernetes upstream, some of them done by other Red Hatters, but we are, we are sort of a stewards. So like promised, I'll first deal with the, what OKD actually is. So if you know Kubernetes, that you can think of OKD as a distribution of Kubernetes, uh, augmented with more features that are aimed mostly for developers. So it helps developers with uh, application lifecycle, etc. If you know OpenShift, which is a family of Red Hat products, then you can think of OKD basically like a uh, upstream for, for, for OpenShift. A little bit similar to what uh, Fedora is for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. If you heard Origin before, then OKD is basically renamed OpenShift Origin. If you don't, if you don't know neither of these, and I'm afraid I can't really help you, go to the URL shown on the slide. And let's continue. What, what OKD practically is, is basically like hundreds of Git repositories uh, developed by more hundreds of people uh, involved in the OpenShift uh, organization on GitHub. And OKD is if you build a bunch of artifacts, which are mostly container images, out of the right revisions from the repositories and use some of these artifacts in the right way on a suitable infrastructure, you get a working OKD cluster, hopefully. All the repositories there are, of course, somehow different. Some are forks of the upstream, various upstreams. Some are OKD specific. Some are, some are uh, intensively developed. Some are pretty much dead, or like mostly stable, not dead. Uh, and the goal of the CI, CI system for OKD is to continuously have a good OKD uh, version, no matter how the individual components are developed at the moment. So the thing is, we always want to have a good OKD, something that works. And to achieve that, we basically need to enforce that for any pull request in any of the component repository, leads us to the OKD that is working. Uh, the reason for this is that once OKD becomes broken, uh, all of the other component teams uh, are basically in the dark. They don't know how uh, they don't know how their development affects the whole the whole OKD. And together uh, today, we, we we are in this state. Uh, although people who are probably at this very moment praying for the end-to-end -end tests in OKD to finally pass for a 20th attempt or something would probably laugh at me, laugh at me bitterly, perhaps. Uh, one big principle that we would like to have in the, over, uh, in the CI system in, for OKD is that we would like the component teams, the developers of the components of the OKD, uh, is to self-service and own their CI config as much as, as, much as possible. But at the same time, we don't we don't need to, we don't want them to own own it like and and go to a different direction because otherwise uh, we wouldn't have no like base criteria and the idea of having good working OKD would be lost. So no, so we, we need at least some base criteria that are somehow enforced throughout the whole whole organization on all of the on all of the components. And this like idea of self-service and ownership comes a bit out of the history because OKD and previously Origin, of course, uh, uh, as a major and quite established project, has a lot of history. I don't really want to delve into, into this hist history. But I, I will suffice to say that in the past, most of the CI system for, for Origin in, uh, at that time was based on Jenkins and a bunch of custom-built and auxiliary tools. And now it's uh, it's all built over a system that's called Prow. Prow is uh, like the front part of the ship or something like that, that which brings us to nautical uh, nautical terms. Like we are in Kubernetes world, of course. 
So the switch to Prow is actually quite recent. So uh, when I prepared this talk, uh, one of my resources was a talk by Michalis Kargakis, who at DEF CON last year talked about why, uh, what, what, what were the problems with, uh, with Jenkins's and Jenkins-based infrastructure, uh, why did they decide to switch to something else, and uh, how it went uh, at the initial stages. So if you are interested in this kind of history, go, go Google his talk, it's actually pretty, pretty interesting. And uh, now I'm, when I dealt with history, I will continue talking about Prow, what Prow really, like what Prow is. So Prow is a Kubernetes-based CI CD system. That's a lot of buzzwords there. So what Prow actually is, is a, it's a bunch of stateless and very loosely coupled microservices, each, their, each one doing their own thing. They are designed to be running uh, inside a Kubernetes cluster. And together, they somehow implement a continuous integration system. So for example, there is a component, it's called hook. That its only job is to watch what, what is happening inside Git, Git repositories, and it dispatches these events to the, the, to the other uh, components that, that care about some of these events. There is a set, totally, separate, uh, so, totally separate component that only heard, um, handles merging of, of pull requests. And there are many more, about like 20, 25, something like that, perhaps. What any of these, uh, any of these uh, services do not do is uh, they, they do not care about scheduling and resource management and all these like, things that you would probably need to handle when you are running Jenkins because they are running on Kubernetes and Kubernetes is actually quite good at scheduling and running workloads from pretty much wherever as long as the workloads are somehow containerized. And Prow is actually, it's not an OKD thing, it's a Kubernetes thing. It originated in the Kubernetes uh, upstream. Uh, it's used there, and we in OKD run our own instance, uh, which some of you may know as API CI cluster. It's mostly there for running Prow. Another description of uh, what Prow is, uh, is coming from the upstream uh, documentation for Prow. And the documentation says that it's actually like if this, then that system for GitHub, more like developer oriented perhaps, but still. And by default, what the, what the components are implementing is a, a library of default triggers and actions that are somehow useful for implementing a CI system. Uh, Prow is very designed to stay out of your way as a developer, so the only, if everything goes well, you only interact with, uh, with Prow uh, via GitHub. There is no separate system that you need to go to. There's pre pretty much nothing else. You get informations via GitHub comments, via labels. Sometimes Prow does something with, with, your, with your pull request or something. And you should only like leave GitHub if you if something went terribly wrong and you perhaps need to follow a link to 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 C log or something and Pro can display logs to you. So what Pro does can be separated into three main areas. So the first thing that many of the components are implementing is it improves development workflows for developers and improves them above what GitHub itself uh, offers, especially for the big and like, distributed communities like Kubernetes or OKD. Uh, so I'll try to give a few examples. So there is a component that watches PRs and just only labels them with how big the change they actually bring. There's a totally separate component which uh, knows who are the people who are likely to be a good reviewers for the pull request and assigns them to review a pull request. There's a different thing that uh, records the fact that the code was positively reviewed, as indicated by the slash command LGTM, and records this fact as another label. I, there's a like, theme occurring there like with the labels. Uh, there's a different thing that watches PRs that needs to be rebased because the base branched, moved in the meantime, and label, labels the PR. It tracks approvals, which in the Prow world is a slightly different process than a simple code review. Like code review says the code is good or code is bad, and approval is meant to be something like, do we want this feature? Is the feature in the right area of, of, of the whole thing? Like this like big 
ideologic uh, answers. Uh, and finally, like fi final example is like it automates what humans like to do, which is like re-triggering the te failing test indefinitely until they actually pass. So you, with Prow, you don't longer need to do it yourself. Prow does it for you. Uh, all, of, all of these actions like are performed by separate little components. And you can notice that they are really, really simple. They just watch for some, some event to happen on a GitHub repository and do a very little, very simple action somewhere else. Do a label, comment, something, something like that. Trigger a test. So the second big part that, that Prow offers to users or developers is it handles merging. Uh, so in, in Prow world, it's not humans who are triggering the merge button. Uh, to, to accept the PRs, it's robots. There is a component, it's called tide, like, like when the sea tide is rising and, and, and going. Tide know what the criteria are uh, for, for a PR to be accepted and merged, and it enforces them. Uh, it's better than humans because it, doesn't, it does this all the time and immediately, so you don't need to wait until the senior accepting guy finally wakes up somewhere in Japan. Uh, it does it efficiently. I'll get to that in a while. It doesn't force merge because it thinks it's a rock star developer and it's a Friday afternoon, so it's probably okay. So the way how Tide communicates with you uh, within a pull request is with this little GitHub check. That's just a Tide. It's, this pull request is not mergeable because it needs LGTM label. And you, you just need, you, you know that you just need to bother someone to put the little uh, comment there, some other Prow component would put the label there, and Ty will say, okay, this is now mergeable. If you, if you want to know more about this, you can follow the details link and you get the full criteria. So Ty enforces that the old tests are, pass, uh, are passing, and even better, uh, just before something is mergeable and it would be merged, Ty is checking the, whether the tests, uh, test results are fresh enough. Uh, that means if the tests were performed on the, over the current tip of the branch, of the, of the, uh, of the target branch. If it's not, if, if the target branch moved in the meantime and we have the old, uh, we have old test results, tight re-triggers the test so we always merge something that's probably working. Of course, this means that whenever anything is merged into the branch, it invalidates pretty much all of the existing test results which would ultimately limit the throughput for merging. So Prow, uh, Prow, Prow, Prow 2, but Tide actually, is smart enough to do the merging in batches. Uh, so if there are multiple PRs waiting, wait, waiting to be merged and they, are, they would be mergeable, uh, merging any one of them would invalidate results on all of them. So, so Prow just takes all of them, attempt to merge them and test over, over the final result. If, if, the, if the result of merging all of them would uh, pass the test, it merges, merges them all at once. And you can also see, and not just test, it also uh, tight tracks what labels are present on the pull request. So remember all those little labels that the various components were putting on the, on the pull request? So tight, tight cares about them and is able to say, I'm, I'm missing this one, should be there. And this is something that shouldn't be there, so get it removed. I, 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 won't, I won't merge it. And of course, it doesn't merge anything that's uh, in conflict. That's not that, that's no rocket science. So that's merging. And uh, third, and for the part of continuous integration system, probably the most important and most complicated part are proud jobs. Uh, so, so the concept of proud jobs is like the if this then that on steroids, which is like we know that something's happening in the in the GitHub repository, so we want to execute something, and that something is very useful to be a test workload. So we are in the Kubernetes, so the something is basically a Kubernetes pod. So as long as I have something containerized, I will just submit it. It will execute. Prow will check whether it was executed successfully or not and uh, report that back. There are three types of jobs, depending on how they are triggered, in what cases they are triggered. Uh, the easiest one, uh, we call them periodics, is just like time-based trigger. So 
it's 12, 12 a.m., let's just run some tests every day or every week or something like that. Very simple. Something more complicated are post submits. So post submits run whenever there are new commits on, on some branch. In the usual world, that, that means some pull requests were just merged, so we need to do something. In this case, it's not that much useful for testing because it was just merged, so it's too late for have any kind of meaningful testing. We want to have testing before we merge uh, so we don't get bad code on the branch. So this is useful for like reports and artifact builds and stuff like that. So we'll get to that a bit later. And the third one, mo mostly useful for testing, are pre-submits, uh, which are run whenever any uh, uh, when there are new commits in the proposed pull requests. Uh, like I said, these are most useful for, for, for tests because they, they, can, they can run and they can report their results to the PR to uh, which they are testing. So these can be used to gate merging pull requests to any, uh, to any repository. So uh, let me now describe, like we know what the, what the jobs are actually. So if I'm a component owner, I, I have proud deploy. What, I, what do I do to actually like, create a job or, or something? So we are a Kubernetes, so we write YAML, a like, lot of YAML, of course, uh, and track it in Git. So this is a, even, it's even shorter example of how a job might look like. So this is a pre-submit that's set up for the CI operator repository in the OpenShift organization. It has a name, which doesn't really matter that much. This part is a standard Kubernetes pod spec, which just tells what to run, coming from which image, that, that, that's, that's it. It's a pre-submit, so it has a bunch of options that allow you to fine tune when it actually should be uh, triggered and how. So you can see, like there's a reg regular expression called trigger, which, which uh, allows you to uh, use a slash command inside your Git, uh, GitHub pull request and probably will trigger this, this pre-submit. And finally, as a pre-submit, it has something called context, which is nothing more than just the name under which the, uh, under which Prow will report its results to the, to the GitHub pull request. And that's, that's pretty much it. So let's just go back to this heap of YAML. So this is a single job. If I'm a, if I am a owner and I'm supposed to use, and I prowl, what, what I'm supposed to do, I'm just supposed to like, write one, two, ten of these, of these uh, jobs in YAML. It's, uh, I would, of course, need to uh, make sure that I have all my test workloads containerized, or, or I would need to have like, a way how to containerize them easily. So it's, it's probably is nice, allows us to run pretty much anything, but it's still a lot of work to get to the actual useful CI system. So enter CI operator. Now, if you, if you lived in a Kubernetes or OpenShift world in the last year, year or so and you saw some of the talks here on DevConf, you probably heard the word operator in a certain context. So yeah, CI operator is not that operator. I have no idea, I have no idea how the name was born. So, in, in CI operator, the O word is just, just a part of the name. That's it. So what it's not, we know. Uh, so let's focus on what it actually is. So uh, CI operator is a tool that knows uh, that it will probably r be run in a context of a proud job. And it knows how to achieve and simplify the usual tasks that the, all the OKD components might want to perform within the pro jobs. So it knows that when something runs within a pro job, it uh, pro exposes information about why we are running this job. So there is something called job spec, to, uh, which the thing that's running inside a pro job uh, can see. And uh, we see here that we know what is being tested. So we, we see that uh, there's a certain revision coming from a certain pull request that's supposed to be merged to a master branch of a component, uh, to, of a repository called component in an organization called OpenShift. So we know what should be tested, like up to the certain revision in Git. So the only thing remaining is we don't know how to test it. 
and we allow, or CI operator allows uh, component owner to define how their component should be tested, how it fits into OKD distribution and stuff like that, the, us the usual stuff, inside something that, is, that we call a component config. So what is component config? It's of course more YAML. Uh, so the first usual action to execute is to execute test uh, from that component repository. So, or more generally, it's an action to run some commands when you have checked out the, the component repository. So here's an example of the component config. Uh, so given a build root image, uh, release OpenShift Golang 1.10, which uh, is supposed to contain all the necessary dependencies to build this actual component. When I, uh, CI operator allows me to specify the, via the test binary build command stanza, the, the command that CI operator can use to uh, build the binaries for the component. And also after, after those are built, we can, uh, it tells CI operator, it can run the make test unit command uh, in the, inside the uh, component repository, which uh, executes something that happens to be unit test for, for this. And now CI operator is not, does not really do all this like image building something complicated legwork itself. Uh, like Prow uses Kubernetes to do the stuff Kubernetes do, do well. Uh, CI operator uses OKD or OpenShift for, for stuff that OKD does well. Uh, so it uses OKD features like builds and image streams uh, to do the actual like, work, building images and, and moving images from, from place to another place uh, through, to, to, through the image streams. And CI operator only orchestrates this as a OKD client. So a containerized tests are the most simple action to be specified for CI operator to execute. And once we, once we, uh, once we have this uh, kind of component config, uh, running these tests uh, when you have a API CI cluster or some other prow enabled cluster, it's just as simple as running CI operator and target unit and uh, CI operator will do everything. So the second, useful action that all the components uh, need to successfully do is they need to be able to build our image so that the image can be included in, in OKD, in the whole big OKD collection. Again, CI operator made this quite simple. You provide a base image, which is some mostly shared for all, for all uh, components, and uh, you provide the instruction how the CI operator should build the image from the base, uh, the component image from the base image, and the CI operator makes it easily happen with a similar call like before. When it can build component images, it can also do uh, mockingly build something like OKD builds, which are called release payloads, and which are mostly collection of specific component image versions. And it, again, it's as simple as running with a different target. The last thing, if, if, if we have a co collection of OKD images, which are known to be good for some definition of good, they, they work, and we have this single image that was just built, that's a candidate image for a single component, uh, then we can use, like put them together uh, and install the whole thing and uh, deploy a new cluster and execute various end-to-end -end tests to see whether like, the resulting OKD cluster would behave well or not. Uh, I stressed in the previous examples that running say operator to achieve something is simple, calling target. In this case, it's not easy. Uh, it's not that easy because the, the whole functionality is achieved by using OpenShift templates. Uh, but our tooling in, in, in the current state, it's, it's, it's actually very easy to set up as long as the result will be run within CI. It's not that easy to run it locally on your, on your workstation. Uh, we have multiple templates available for, for component owners to use. Uh, the two most used are, uh, the first one is uh, executing a shared OKD uh, test suite, 
which basically verifies that whatever we just created is a well-behaving OKD cluster. And the second one is uh, allows component owner to run more uh, detailed end-to-end -end unit tests coming from their uh, component repository against the freshly installed cluster. And this is, of course, used to like, allow more thorough, uh, more thorough testing of the component on the test in the context of a freshly installed OKD cluster. So, and the last thing that CI operator can do, so if we uh, just, if we uh, execute all the tests that we have available, we assemble the, we assemble the re release payload, we run all the and to end testing about the freshly de uh, on, on freshly deployed clusters, we can CI operator can promote the image to be included in the next batch of what is now a good OKD cluster, and this image would be almost immediately available for the other uh, parts that are just starting testing, for example, and and. Well, if we have everything set up, that, that means that we just have a PR. It is, it is tested. Everything passes. Uh, it gets merged. The image are, images are built. It gets included into the, in the good OKD. And from that point, other components or even my component will use this new OKD. So we get this gradual, this component is good, this component is good. Again, people who are like praying for, the, for their end-to-end -end test uh, to finally allow them to merge would perhaps disagree, but we kind of are there a bit. So uh, now we have Prow that executes something for us, and we have like CI operator which allow us to easily specify that some, that something meaningful for Prow to execute. So we are right now in a situation that again, if I am a component owner. Uh, what I would need to do to set up CI for my component. I would need to write a little YAML for the CI operator stating, this is my component, this is how it's tested. And I would need to write even more YAML for Prow, so execute CI operator for this target and execute CI operator for another target. When this happens, then that happens. So that's more, like, that's still like a hundred lines of YAML for each component. Uh, it's easier than before that at least I need, uh, I need to just specify CI operator instead of preparing paths and handling image builds myself, but still we are not that, we are not there yet. So we were not there yet. Right now we are. Uh, all of the configs, all, all the YAMLs that I described for both Prow and CI operator is living inside a single separate uh, Git repository. It, it's not just these configs that are living there, it's like general prow config and some other config and other things. So what, what, how, how the whole CI is currently configured lives in this repository. And by, I mentioned that we want self-service. So this means we want everyone to submit their configuration changes, submit PRs to this repository. Uh, but until around August, uh, last year, all of the jobs for uh, all of the YAML for jobs lived in a single YAML file, which at that time was like 5,000 lines of YAML for all the components. Uh, and of course, uh, this is not very scalable when you expect like tens of people at least to own their own jobs. So the obvious thing that we like did was create this little hierarchy when each component uh, have their own directory. So that's this is now the case, so we have this. That, that made it easier for teams to uh, own their jobs. Uh, after we have few early adopters on board it with Prow together with CI operator, uh, there were patterns starting to emerge, uh, and that means that like the successful adopters mostly uh, used CI operator to define all the tests. They, they usually define, okay, we have something that's unit test, something that's uh, integration test, perhaps an end-to-end -end test. We can build image or two or 10 or something. And uh, all of them basically just, just did the matching part uh, inside Prow. So what happened is that everyone set a pre-submit that uh, run pretty much all the tests and built images. 
So, so they had pre-submit running the unit tests, pre-submit running the integration tests, pre-submit running the end-to-end -end tests, pre-submit that would attempt to uh, build the images, and a post-submit that would build the images and promote them. So that was the pattern that emer emerged. And of course, because we ask people to write 100 tons of YAML, it's not that all of the adopters would write the YAML themselves from scratch, but they copied it from each other, which in even reinforced uh, the, the pattern. Uh, and like copy paste means mistake. Uh, nobody really wanted to deal with prow jobs uh, anymore. Uh, prow configuration became boilerplate, and nobody liked boilerplate. So we decided to get rid by uh, get rid of it. Get rid of the prow uh, job boilerplate. The way how we did it uh, was that we built something called prowgen, and that's. Not, nothing more complicated than just taking all of the av available tests and generating jobs for running the, all the available tests in the, in the pattern that I described on the last slide, which is execute everything before merge and build images and promote them after merge. That, that's it. So that means now nobody really needs to care about frau config. Of course, if they want to, and some, some people do, because it allows you to have more flexibility. You don't need to care about prow config. So it's not hundreds of YAML anymore. You just need to write something like 40 lines per component once and then just perhaps adapt it when you need to add a new test type or something like that. And uh, having stuff generated and having thousands of lines of YAML in the repositories and there were still like copy paste uh, occurring uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, mistakes were still very likely, like copy paste, typos, leaving files somewhere that shouldn't be, uh, preparing a CI operator config file but not running the generator, running the old versions of the generator, all of these like little things why the YAML can be uh, like painful to use. So on OpenShift release, we lint, test, and cross-check everything with extreme prejudice on incoming PRs, uh, which means that like getting the change there uh, might be a little painful because unless you check it for uh, yourself locally, you submit some change, I want a new job, and some, some, some part of config says, uh, says no, that's like, like you, have a, you have a hyphen where an underscore should be go away and you fix it and some, some other checks notices, so this is badly ordered, you need, we need to like you have this deterministically ordered. Oh, you have Python. Fix all these Python errors. Everything. So we are very, we are very, very strict on on, uh, on the configuration. But the result is, when something goes in, it usually works. Uh, for, at least for our part. If just if 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 we if you tell us that your uh, that your uh, repository has a make target called unit tests and it doesn't, that's not well something that we could check. Or we could. I will touch this in a while. So uh, at some point, like two months ago, something like that, uh, it seemed like Prowgen and all the checks were the missing piece. It made adoption earlier. We saw like pretty much everyone, everyone uh, being on board in Prow, and we were finally in a state when, despite there were like constantly changed config, new jobs, removed jobs. Uh, and everything, uh, CI worked, and it worked well. So we were able to focus on improving the experience of the job authors. Uh, there are many, and I selected like two because they are like technically interesting about uh, about what we are trying to achieve. So the first thing that like we had a common pitfall. So let's imagine that we, for example, added a job for a certain repository. And this change, like adding a job, was merged while there was a pull request uh, in flight on the target repository. So that was, that was filed before the job was merged, but it was, for example, waiting for a review or something. So, 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 the, so the sequence was there was a target tested repository pull request. We merged a change that brought a new job. Something reviewed the, or uh, someone origin, uh, someone, Someone reviewed the original uh, pull request, and now, now it wouldn't merge because 
like the type, the component that handles merging, knows, okay, there are all these steps that need to pass, and this, this pull, request pull, pull request doesn't pass everything, because there was nothing that would trigger the newly, uh, newly added job on all the PRs that were in flight. So that was a problem. This was the such PR would be stuck until someone came and, and I re-triggered the test manually or, or something like that. And removing and adding uh, and changing jobs would cause similar problems. That it was like pain, a huge pain because nobody like we had a lot of questions. Why this, why doesn't this merge and why doesn't that merge? So we, and by we I mean my uh, team lead Steve, uh, wrote a prow component that would be watching for, for like job config changes and immediately would uh, apply this like little inf intervention automatically. So whenever we add a new job for, for, a, for a repository, it triggers this new job on all the PRs that are currently open for the rep repository. We, if we remove a job, uh, we make sure that, that this, like the context from the or removed jobs is removed from, the, from all the PRs that are in flight and something like that. So these problems no longer happen. Uh, tight mostly merges flawlessly and happily. So the second, second thing that we are right now uh, focusing uh, uh, on building is that we still have uh, this anti-pattern we, observe, we observe, observe on uh, our repositories. So when a component over wants to set up a something uh, for, for his CI, he goes to our repository, the OpenShift release one, and does some change and uh, gets, gets it merged. And then they go back to their own target repository, file a new PR to test what they actually did in the CI config repository to observe if the right, core, uh, if the right jobs were triggered, if they are executing what they should, and if, uh, if not, if something went wrong, they go back to our repository, try again, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat. And that's, of course, people, people are doing that and not actually that much complaining about it. But we are not, we don't like it. So we are working on a feature that would, uh, we call it rehearsal, rehearse jobs. So if you submit a PR to our uh, CI job config, uh, we would detect how does it affect jobs, if it brings new ones, if it changes some existing ones, if it changes something that's used indirectly by, uh, by some of the jobs. And we try to rehearse it and give at the OpenShift release uh, pull request, give the uh, job author feedback about how would the job behave if it were executed on the, on the target repository. Uh, so we know we won't be able to do rehearsals for all of the jobs. Uh, and we are not sure if we like want to, for example, if you change one of the base templates I mentioned before, if we really want to rehearse something that would at that second try to uh, schedule 200 jobs, each attempting to bring up a full new cluster, we'll sort it out, uh, but the feature is, uh, feature is coming. So that's what are we doing right, right now. So I promised some, some view on the future in the title, uh, so I'll get to that. So with everything this, it's, uh, the feature is mostly stable, and the biggest pain probably everyone has in the OKD organizations so, uh, is that the, the investigation of, failure is, of failures is not very, very easy. If you have a job failing on you, especially one of the template-based jobs to try to bring up a whole cluster and run all of the uh, OKD conformance tests, uh, it's, it's painful. <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, sometimes there are no logs. Sometimes there are logs, but the, there are so many moving parts that uh, it's, it's very easy to find. Our, uh, it's very easy to miss the artifacts, if, if, even if they are there. So we would like to focus more on improving the experience on investigating failures. And uh, we also want to focus more into bringing like metrics and alerts there, uh, mostly on uh, mostly on test results and, and uh, analysis of uh, analysis of data of test results, like investigating flakes and stuff like that. So uh, 
There's a reason why we currently do not have that much in OKD, and that's the reason is that uh, in this, we are mostly alone on our own in OKD. In upstream, Google feeds everything, all the artifacts into some like internal big tables or into, uh, uh, into a tool called Take Test Grid, which we can't really deploy because it's not open source yet. So we have nothing to reuse, and unfortunately, all the priorities were different so far. So that's like two main areas we would like to improve in the future. And I'd like to wrap up the whole thing with, with few numbers. Uh, so right now, I checked, I checked yesterday, uh, we have seven, around 700 jobs set up for 120 repositories spread out in 10 organizations. So it's not longer just the, uh, it's not longer just the or OpenShift organization, but people are setting up jobs for their like personal accounts, or we have some, I think we have something in Knative and, and other orgs. When I said that in August, we had uh, 5,000 lines of YAML, so now our jobs are like 35,000 uh, lines of YAML, which I was not sure if I even want to include, if, if it's a good thing or bad thing. The good thing is definitely that most of the people, most, 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 most people do not really like need to care about this number. If they even need to care about job, job configuration YAML, they find like little component specific uh, files with, I don't know, 100 or 200 of, of lines. So that's, that's quite, quite reasonable, I think. And uh, right now, like the whole OKD end-to-end -end tests are getting pull requests incoming into like around 70 repositories in OpenShift uh, organization. In last 24 hours, and I'm lying a bit because I, like, like I said, I checked the numbers yesterday evening. Uh, we executed around 2,600 2, 2, jobs. Uh, I checked just before I went to this talk, and it was around 2,200, like 400 less, and that's probably what we get by doing uh, DEF CON on Friday. Uh, all the jobs were triggered for 233 uh, different pull requests, and out of the 2,600 jobs, 600 jobs were actually trying, at least trying to deploy a full cluster and, and test something around that. So with these numbers, I'm wrapping it up, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mike. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not that long in this organization, so I, I, would, I would probably make things up. I, I don't know. Sorry. I can ask, but I'm half a year back in Red Hat. So that's, that's my time span. More questions? Go ahead. Uh, how much of resource to support all the API <coughs> I do we have the cluster on OpenShift org? I also you come to uh, like AWS. So for, for support all the API jobs. Uh, can you repeat, please? I was like. So the resource is to run all the CI jobs. Like part of it is on the uh, cluster on OpenShift org. Uh, as in your example, and other types on AWS. So, uh, how many resources you need uh, to support the job? Uh, I'm not able to, to answer how many resources we, uh, the, the question is how many resources we uh, need to execute all of this. And the thing is I, I'm, not, I'm not able to answer this question because our cluster on which all the, all the test workloads are running is out of scaling, so it just like asks what, what we don't care. <laughs> Someone pays the bill.
More questions? Uh, on the manual QA, is there still a step for manual testing before taking the pull request or, or after everything is merged before we release? Uh, the question I understand is if there is some manual testing involved in this process. Uh, in OKD organization, only the manual testing that whoever submits the PR does before uh, like before we, before he submits the PR. So for OKD, which is a community distribution, I don't think there are any like systematic testing efforts. I certainly not manual. I'm not able to comment on like like the OpenShift products because I don't know. Martin. Uh, it should be something around 40 minutes. The question was, how long does it take to run all the tests? So uh, it's all parallel. So it's we, we the duration is whatever like takes longest, and the end to uh, end tests are the one that run uh, longest, and it should be something around 40 minutes. Sometimes it's more, especially when we have failing tests, which a lot of fails are ba based on timeout and stuff, which makes the whole execution longer. Oh, Mike, again. Uh, if there's a change that touches multiple services and like the dependent behavior change, how do you handle that? Uh, we don't. We don't do that well. So all of the, uh, oh, there, is anything, there, there isn't anything more smarter than like test individual component in a context what's currently being like well, uh, like assembled as good OpenShift. Uh, there is a step that I missed, like between the promoting an image and it being available in for, for next testing, like it's uh, handled by something called release controller. And after we, after we, uh, after something assembles the new release for other like tests to use, it runs these tests again. So if if something like passed isolated uh, testing and would be include it and something else would do the same thing and that there would be some like timing race and and collision it's likely that the like this thing that has the whole uh, that has the whole thing again would discover it and would not uh, would not pass this thing to be like the latest known good okd to other tests so we would just continue to use the old good okd Yes, correct. More questions? Yeah, uh, it's. I think the question was if, if we, in the case when we want to build images for components, whether we always need to, like, whether the user needs always to provide a Docker file or whether there are other uh, other means how to build images. I think right now there are no other means, and it's not decided by like us, but it's, it's decided by an architect who would, like decides how the images for OKD and later OpenShift products should be built. So right now it's only Docker files. So I guess that's it. So thank you for all those questions. <laughs>